Okay. Here we are. Here we are. Welcome to the final portion. The 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 after game party, if you will. The tailgate? What's this tailgate party? No, that's before the game, isn't it? Do you do a tailgate party before or at can an a can a can a straight guy tell me what? I don't know sports. Um, Fahrenheit 451. We've read it. We sat here together. My lovely co-host and I, Count Dracula. Count, welcome. Welcome. Good evening. Dave, we've done it. We've read a book that a small child could read. I know. I'm a little shocked myself. I'm a little proud. By the way, total side note, I'm sorry. We're, this is going to be a bit out there today. Um, we're not focused. <laughs> I just feel like I should tell you, um, <clears throat> gentle listener, total behind the scenes action here. I don't know what it is, but ever since I've woke up, I've had Tone Loke's wild thing. In my head, hard, like it is bumping hard in there. I'm not saying I'm mad about that particularly, but so it just out of nowhere, it just, it just started. Anyway, um, so some things we're going to do, we, 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 we have some things to, to finish count. In the, the back of the book, there's a little afterward. There's like a, a little 10-page <clears throat> ten page uh, bonus material, I guess. That's what this is. This is the part four of our project here, the special features, where we just kind of mop up, right? We've read the story. The story's good. You don't, you're not going to get any, find any new insights or anything in this little part. We're going to read the afterward and the coda or whatever, um, and we're going to drink. While we do that, so let me be the first to kick things off. Count Dracula, you're looking very festive with your construction worker hat with two beer cans filled with filthy hooker blood. Looks good. Looks good. Thank you, Dave. I wanted to order a fire hat, but they were out of stock. I had to go with this one. Well, that's all right. Cheers, Count. Cheers, my friend. Uh... Let's get the alcohol started. As we celebrate, we we celebrate literacy, literally, here. Um, because if there's one thing that I think Ray Bradbury would want, it's for us to get smashed and read his uh, his afterward here. So let's get to that. Also, after this, I have a little present for you. I didn't want to say anything, but um, just a little extra. If you've been, if you've been a good boy or girl, and you've listened to this uh, in its entirety, where uh, the count and I got a little review after 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 this. So if you want to hang around for that, uh, you can. All right, here goes. Afterward, I didn't know it, but I was literally writing a dime novel. In the spring of 1950, it cost me $9.80 in dimes to write and finish the first draft of The Fireman, which later became Fahrenheit 451. In all the years from 1941 to that time, I had done most of my typing in in, in the family garages, either in Venice, California, where we lived because we were poor, not because it was the in place to be, or behind the tract house where my wife, Marguerite, and I raised our family. Marguerite's the wife from Resident Evil 7, isn't she? With the beehive snatch? Probably. Um, I was driven out of my garage by my loving children who insisted on coming around to their rear window and singing and tapping on the panes. What a bunch of annoying fuckers. Father, that was me, that wasn't him. Father had to choose between finishing a story or playing with the girls. I chose to play, of course, which endangered the family income. An office had to be found. We couldn't afford one. 
Finally, I located just the place, the typing room in the basement of the library at the University of California at Los Angeles. There, in neat rows, were a score or more of old Remington or Underwood typewriters, which rented out at a dime a half hour. Anybody out there remember typewriters? I remember typewriters. I remember a typewriter. I remember I loved the smell of typewriter ink. It smells so good. And um, then when Resident Evil 1 came out and you actually used typewriter ribbons to save uh, your progress, I remember every time I would do it, I would think, oh, this typewriter ink ribbon smells so good. It does. And then I remember um, I, gr- like, I, I, I had a typewriter, like an actual typewriter when I was young, and then I graduated to a word processor, which was like a weird hybrid computer typewriter mixed it's like the vcr dvd combo of typing so it was like if i'm remembering this correctly it was a typewriter thing but it had a little screen and what you could do is you could type out your sentence beforehand on the little screen and see it and check it make sure there's no errors or anything and then you like press the type button and then the typewriter types the rest of it at the time i was like well i'm obviously living in star trek it's never going to get any better than this I was right. Anyway. <clears throat> you thrust your dime in, the clock ticked madly, and you typed wildly to finish before the half hour ran out. Thus I was twice driven, by children to leave home and by a typewriter timing a typewriter timing device to be a maniac at the keys. Time was indeed money. I finished the first draft in roughly nine days. At 25,000 words, it was half the novel it would it eventually would become. Between investing dimes and going insane when the typewriter jammed, for there went your precious time, and whipping pages in and out of the device, I wandered upstairs. There I strolled, lost in love, down the corridors and through the stacks, touching books, pulling volumes out, turning pages, thrusting volumes back, drowning in all the good stuffs that are the essence of libraries. What a place, don't you agree, to write a future novel about burning books in the future. To write a... I'm sorry, I... I I implanted the word future there. What a place, don't you agree, to write a novel about burning books in the future. So much for pasts. What about Fahrenheit 451 in this day and age? Have I changed my mind about much that it said to me when I was a younger writer? Only if by change... You mean, has my love of libraries widened and deepened? To which the answer is a yes that ricochets off the stacks and dusts, dusts talcum and dusts talcum off the librarian's cheek. Talcum powder? What is that? What does that do? I don't know. Who can, who knows? I don't want to, I don't want to look up talcum powder because I feel like I should know this. Is that just, we'll say it's, he's talking about cocaine is what he's talking about. He's <laughs> He's talking librarian talcum, otherwise known as angel dust, okay? Since writing this book, I have spun more stories, novels, essays, and poems about writers than any other writer in history that I can think of. I have written poems about Melville, Melville and Emily Dickinson, Emily Dickinson and Charles Dickens, Hawthorne, Poe, Edgar Rice, Burroughs, and along the way I compared Jules Verne to his mad captain to Melville and his equally obsessed mariner. I have scribbled poems about librarians take creepy taking night trains with my <laughs> now I have night train in my head never to return taking night trains with my favorite authors <laughs> favorite authors across the continental wilderness S- staying up all night gabbing and drinking drinking and chatting drinking all right my kind of guy. I warned Melville in one poem to stay away from land. It was never his stuff and turn Bernard Shaw into a robot. So as to conveniently stow him aboard a rocket and wake him on the long journey to Alpha Centauri to hear his, pre- his prefaces, prefa- prefaces, prefaces piped off his tongue and into my delighted ear. Why didn't I drink? I should have drank while I read the the normal book because then whenever I screw up I could just be like oh, I'm drunk I'm not I'm not dumb I'm actually very smart I'm just completely smashed right now so 
I should have done that. But no, I did. I, 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 I know why I did. I did it out of respect. Out of respect, because I'd rather be sober and dumb, and at least try. Now that you know, we're just reading the after parts. I don't mind. I don't mind being. Uh, I don't mind having. Let's just say problems. Um. <clears throat> I've written a time machine story in which I hum back to sit at the deathbeds of Wild, Melville, and Poe to tell of my love and warm their bones in their last hours. But enough. Jesus, that's morbid, isn't it? Like I fantasize about finding people I respect and love and comforting them as they die. Is that... I mean, I guess... I get, well, maybe that is better. You don't want them at the height... Of their fame and whatever, because they'll just regard you like a fan, kind of. You know, like, let's say you really like, oh, I don't know, Kenny Loggins. You want to get him when he's dying. Is he still alive? Is Kenny Loggins still alive? I don't know. I'm not going to look it up. I'm not about that life anymore. Uh, I'm out of the Loggins game. But, you know, you want him when he's, like, dying because he can't go anywhere. He can't, he can't uh, big shot you, you know? But if you got him during his heyday and you were like, oh my god, it's Kenny Loggins. He'd be like, I love your stuff, Kenny. You changed my life. He'd be like, bah, bah. he'd be all coked out somewhere or something. I don't know. To be honest with you, I'm not really too sure who Kenny Loggins is. Did he do Danger Zone? I don't know. <sighs> don't blame me if this is not entertaining. Blame it on the a- 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 alcohol. But enough, as you can see, I am madness maddened when it comes to books, writers, and the great granary silos where their wits are stored. Recently, with the Studio Theater Playhouse in Los Angeles at hand, I called all my characters from F-451 out of the shadows. What's new, I said to Montag, Clarice, Faber, Beatty, since last we met in 1953. I asked. They answered. They wrote new scenes, revealed odd parts of their as-yet-undiscovered souls and dreams. The result was a two-act drama staged with good results and, in the main, fine reviews. Beatty came farthest out of the wings in answer to my question. How did it start? What did you make? Why did you make the decision to become Fire Chief, a burner of books? Beatty's surprising answer came in a scene where he takes our hero, Guy Montag, home to his apartment. Entering, Montag is stunned to discover that discover the thousands upon thousands of books lining the walls of... Oh, fuck. Sorry. All right, here, let me turn off my computer speakers. I apologize. Uh, <clears throat> thousands upon thousands of books lining the walls of the fire chief's hidden library. Montag turns and cries out to his superior, but you're the chief burner. You can't have books on your premises. Premises... To which the chief, with a dry, light smile, replies, It's not owning books that's a crime, Montag. It's reading them. Yes, that's right. I own books, but don't read them. Montag in shock awaits Beatty's explanation. Don't you see the beauty, Montag? I never read them. Not one book. Not one chapter. Not one page. Not one paragraph. I do play with ironies, don't I? To have thousands of books and never crack one? To turn your back on the lot and say no? It's like having a house full of beautiful beautiful women and smiling, not touching one. So you see, I'm not a criminal. I, I'm not a criminal at all. If you ever catch me reading one, yes, then turn me in. But this place is as pure as a twelve-year-old virgin girl's cream white summer night bedroom. Ill. Ill, man. I mean, look, Mr. Bradbury. With all due respect, here at Atomic Disaster Theater, we like the young girls, but we don't like the young girls. If you know what I'm saying. But, you know, it was the 50s, man. We were playing fast and loose. Didn't people die when they were like 32 back then? Okay, moving on. These books die on the shelves. Why? Because I say so. I do not give them sustenance. No hope with hand or eye or tongue. They are no better than dust. I actually think that's kind of lame. Because if, I mean, I know this is just a... It's for a play or whatever the fuck, so it's not, like, canon, I guess. I don't know this this particular scene. But it's like, Beatty, you quoted books like a motherfucker throughout the whole... I mean, obviously, you've read... I've never cracked one open, so what? You guessed all those quotes and metaphors you were... <laughs> yeah, I'm a real lucky guy. Yeah, I'm a real lucky guy. 
<laughs> okay. Um, Montag protests. I don't see how that, I don't see how you can't be tempted, cries the fire chief. Oh, that was long ago. The apple is eaten and gone. The snake has returned to its tree. The garden has grown to weed and rust. Once, Montag hesitates, then continues, once you must have loved books very much. Touché, the fire chief responds, blow the belt on the chin, through the heart, ripping the gut. Oh, look at me, Montag, the man who loved books, no, the boy who was wild for them, insane for them, who climbed the stacks like a chimpanzee gone mad for them. I ate them like salad, books were my sandwich for lunch, my tiffin, tiffin, my tiffin and dinner and midnight munch, the fuck? My Tiffin? Okay. All right. This scene, normally, you know, we're, we're, we're chill here. We're relaxed in the after game party. But Tiffin, I got to look up. What's Tiffin? I'm getting, oh, uh, Tiffin is an Indian English word for a type of meal. The fuck? T uh. All right, man. Whatever. Fucking, fucking non-Americans, man. Brunch just isn't good enough. Just not good enough for you guys, huh? Uh -huh. Tiffin and dinner, midnight munch. I tore out the pages, ate them with salt, doused them with relish, gnawed on the bindings. Turned the chapters with my tongue, books by the dozen, the score and the billion. I carried so many home, I was hunched back for years. Philosophy, art history, pol politics... Social science, the poem, the essay, the grand wa play, you name them, I ate them, and then, and then, the fire chief's voice fades. Montag prompts. And then, <clears throat> why life happened to me, the fire chief shuts his eyes to remember life, the usual, the same, the love that wasn't quite right, the dream that went sour, the sex that fell apart, how does sex fall apart? The sex that fell apart? I mean, I could see the sex going, the sex being bad. Like, I know that very well. But the sex falling apart? Dave, how'd that sex you had go? Ah, it fell apart. What? I chopped her head off. I guess that's what he means. Uh, the sex that fell apart, the deaths that came swiftly to friends not deserving, the murder of someone or another, the insanity of someone else, the slow death of a mother, the abrupt suicide of a father, the stampede of elephants, an onslaught of disease, and nowhere, nowhere the right book for the right time to stuff in the crumbling wall of the breaking dam to hold back the deluge, give or take a metaphor, lose or find a simile. And by the far edge of thirty... And the near rim of 31, I picked myself up, every broken bone, every centimeter of flesh, abraded, bruised, or scarred. I looked in the mirror, and I found an old man lost behind the frightened face of a young man. Saw a hatred there for everything and anything. You name it, I damn it. And opened the pages of my fine library books and found what? 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 Montag guesses. The pages were empty? Bullseye. Blank. Oh, the words were there, all right. But they ran over my eyes like hot oil, signifying nothing, offering no help, no solace, no peace, no harbor, no true love, no bed, no light. Montag thinks back. Thirty years ago, the final library burnings. On target, Beatty nods. And having no job and being a failed romantic or whatever in hell, I put in for fireman first class. First up the steps, first into the library, first in the burning furnace heart of this ever-blazing countryman. Douse me with kerosene, hand me my torch. Give me some beer. That last part was me. End of lecture. There you go, Montag. Out the door. Montag leaves with more curiosity than ever about books. Well on his way to becoming an outcast, soon to be pursued and almost destroyed by the mechanical hound, my robot clone of A. Conan Doyle's great Baskerville beast. In my play, Old Man Faber, the teacher not quite in residence, speaking to Montag through the long night via the seashell tampon ear radio, is victimized by the fire chief. How? Beatty suspects Montag is being instructed by such a secret device, knocks it out of his ear, and shouts at the far-removed teacher. We're coming to get you. We're at the door. We're up the stairs. Gotcha. Which so terrifies Faber, his heart destroys him. All good stuff. Tempting, this late in time. I've had to fight not to stuff it in this new printing of the novel. Please, I'm glad he didn't do that. Very glad he didn't do that. Finally, many readers 
have written protesting Clarice's disappearance. Wondering what happened to her, Francois Truffaut, tr- T-R-U-F-F-A-U-T, your guess is as good as mine, Francois Truffaut felt the same curiosity and in his film version of my novel rescued Clarice from oblivion and located her with the book people wandering in the forest, reciting their litany of books to themselves. I felt the same need to save her, for after all, she, verging on silly starstruck chatter, was in many ways responsible for Montag's becoming to wonder about books and what was in them. In my play, there, <coughs> sorry, in my play, therefore, Clarice emerges to welcome Montag and give a somewhat happier ending to what is, in its, in essence, pretty grim stuff. Again, I, I, I respectfully disagree. But we're almost done, so I'll get into that once we finish this first part here. The novel, however, remains true to its former self. I don't believe in tampering with any young writer's material, especially when that young writer was once myself. Montag, Beatty, Mildred, Faber, Clarice all stand, move, enter, and exit as they did 32 years ago when I first wrote them down at a dime a half hour in the basement of the UCLA library. I have changed not one thought or word. At last discovery, I write all of my novels and stories, as you, ha- as you have seen, in a great surge of delightful passion. Only recently, glancing at the novel, I realized that Montag is named after a paper manufacturing company, and Faber, of course, is a maker of pencils. What a sly thing my subconscious was to name them thus and not tell me. Exclamation, po- exclamation mark. So it was, uh, so here, let me redo that with some gusto here. What a sly thing my subconscious was to name them thus. They're not telling me! They're not telling me! Ah! All right, so that's the afterword. We're going to get to the, the, the coda in a second. Let me, uh, let me just wax retarded here for a second. I am so glad. I remember the first time I read it. I read this book, and I thought the same thing. I thought, oh, man, Clarice just dies so suddenly, and she just, like, she's just gone so shockingly and suddenly. That seems anticlimactic. I don't know. That's not happy. Right. It's, yeah, that's good. That's the way it goes. The whole book is a series. Well, not the whole book, but the whole, like, first part of the book is a gentle series of pushes to the main character to kind of set him over the edge to start to do all this drastic stuff later on in the book. If Clarice doesn't die, if she just doesn't, and that scene where, where they're in bed, Mildred and Montag, and she's just offhandedly saying, Oh yeah, I forgot to tell you the girl died. I think. And then he's like, what are you talking about? We can't be talking about the same person. He's like, no. And she's like, no, I, yeah, I am. Uh, Clarice, that the the girl next door, the fucking pog next door, she's dead. There was like this. Oh yeah, side note, you know, like like this kind of flippancy to it, and you're reading it and you're like, what? That that came out of nowhere. Yeah, yeah, you know, like when people die, like when people go and there's no like final scene, there's no tear wrought goodbye there's no like final hug it's not a movie it's just like somebody's there and then they're gone right it's like a a weird like you're walking downstairs and then you miss one or and and, you know what i mean that that kind of like falling feeling for a second that's the way that's perfect right because you have this series of events that all happened so close to each other, and that's what kind of drive Montag nuts and make him do this. <clears throat> and make him burp real loud like that, excuse me. And I, I like that, right? He meets Clarice. Uh, uh, he, he, that, that uh, episode with his wife, you know, where, where, where he comes home and she's, you know, OD'd on fucking sleeping pills. And uh, uh, the, the lady on the call that burned herself up for her books, and then he finds out Clarice died. Like, all of those things happen back to back to back to back, and they're all little gentle nudges that finally push him to to do desperate shit and to start questioning things, see? And that's my main thing 
that I never like with stories of this kind, where there's a character who's kind of ingrained in this society or this mindset, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, he just suddenly turns on a dime and says, oh, wait, I wonder, let me actually think about this and let me look at the other side of this. Um, it always seems so quick. Like there's just this big dramatic event that happens that spins them uh, 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 the other way. And I, I never liked that. I much prefer a series of little things, each one that kind of moves him a little bit further towards what he ends up being. And I think that this book does that as perfect as I've ever seen or read in any movie or whatever the fuck. It just always seems like when telling stories of this kind, there's that big transformative moment. And I don't think it works like that. I th- Or maybe it does, but it, I, for me personally, I think it's more effective to do it in little increments. And and I just loved the perfect storm of things that happened. And if Clarice came back, it would undo the impact of that. Do you know what I mean? If that makes sense. Uh, and I, I, do, I did see the old original movie from like the 60s. And uh, uh, I don't remember much from it, but I do. I do recall Clarice like lived at the end, and I just, I it 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 works better without it because her character and who she is is this chaotic, soulful explosion, and they don't stick around very long. It's like a tornado, right? It comes and it wrecks shit all over the place and it makes a big old mess of your thoughts and whatever the fuck and then it goes away and then it's gone it doesn't hang around so i think that that her showing up in the book for as little as she does and then dying relatively early in it in the first part works perfectly don't touch just leave it the way it is so that those are my thoughts on that I, um yeah, so okay, let's let's get to the second part. Actually, you know what here? Let me finish this. <coughs> Sorry. I did that thing where you don't where you think there's more in a glass or bottle <clears throat> than there is. So you just choke. <laughs> Sorry about that. Cheers, Count. Cheers, Steve. You getting a little tipsy over there already? What, did you spike that hooker blood with uh, some vodka or something? Uh, Moving on. Coda. Coda. About two years ago, a letter arrived from a solemn young Vassar. Vassar? Didn't I... Didn't I... Didn't I um, already... Look that up. V- Vassar. Vassar. What is this? I don't know. Oh, it's a college in Poughkeepsie, New York, founded in 1861. Notable alumni Lisa Kudrow, Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis, Meryl Streep, Mark Ronson, Mike D of the Beastie Boys. Side note, I've always thought Meryl Streep was hot. And I'm not talking about like young Meryl Streep. I mean like Devil Devil Wears Prada Meryl Streep. Yeah, I don't know. I can't explain it. Um, we should probably get. Oh, it's just the it's the alcohol. It's it's the booze. It's not me. I, I don't I don't really mean it. I don't really mean it. Uh, about two years ago, a letter arrived from Meryl Streep. She said, "Do you have Dave's number?" <laughs> About two years ago, a letter arrived from a solemn young Vassar lady telling me how much she enjoyed reading my experiment in space mythology, The Martian Chronicles. What's it about? Don't know. I haven't read it. But, she added, wouldn't it be a good idea this late in time to rewrite the book inserting more women's characters and roles? Oh, I want to punch this broad in her face already. A few years ago... Oh, sorry. A few, I'm, there I go, making up sentences again. A few years before before that, I got a certain amount of mail concerning the same Martian book complaining about the blacks, the blacks in the book. Oh, complaining that the blacks, the blacks in the book. Ooh, Ray. Ray, 
tone it down a little bit there. Uh, a few years before that, I got a certain amount of mail concerning the same Martian book complaining that the blacks in the book were Uncle Tom's and why didn't I, quote, do them over? Along about then came a note from a southern white suggesting that I was prejudiced in favor of the blacks and the entire story should be dropped. Two weeks ago, my mountain of mail delivered forth a pipsqueak mouse of a letter. Pipsqueak mouse of a letter? Like... I... Two weeks ago, my mountain of mail delivered forth a pick-squeak mouse of a letter from a well-known publishing house that wanted to reprint my story, The Foghorn, in a high school reader. Pip-squeak mouse of... Like you're dissing a letter? This fucking pick pipsqueak mouse of a letter. Like, what's a... What's a non-pipsqueak letter? I don't know. I don't know. Sorry. In my story, I had described a lighthouse as having, late at night, an illumination coming from it that was a god light. Looking up at it from the viewpoint of any sea creature, one would have felt that one was in the presence. The editors had deleted god light and in the presence. Some five years back, the editors of yet another anthology for school readers put together a volume with some 400, count them, 400, oh, I'm sorry, they, they, they didn't do that twice. With some 400, count them, short stories in it. How do you cram 400 short stories by Twain, Irving, Poe, Maupassant, M-A-U-P-A-S-S-A-N-T, Maupassant, sorry, I'm just doing my best, and Bierce into one book. Simplicity itself, skin, debone, demorrow, scarify, scarify, melt, render down and destroy, every adjective that counted, every verb that moved, every metaphor that weighed more than a mosquito, out, every simile that would have made a submoron's mouth twitch, he's talking about me there, gone, any aside that explained the two-bit philosophy of a first-rate writer, lost. Every story slenderized, starved, blue-penciled, leached, and bled white, Resembled every other story. Twain read like Poe, read like Shakespeare, read like Do Dostoevsky. Read like, in the finale, Edgar Guest. Every word of more than three syllables had been razored. Every image that demanded so much as one instant's attention shot dead. Do you begin to get the damned and incredible picture? How did I react to all of the above? By firing the whole lot. By sending rejection slips to each and every one. By ticketing the assembly of idiots to the far reaches of hell. The point is obvious. There's more than one way to burn a book. And the world is full of people running about with lit matches. Every minority, be it Baptist, Unitarian, Irish, Italian, or Irish, Italian, Octogenarian, Zen Buddhist, Zionist, Seventh-day Adventist, Women's Lib, Republican, Matt... Mattachine? I don't know what an M-A-T-T-A-C-H-I-N-E is. Mattachine? Foursquare gospel feels it has the will, the right, the duty to douse the kerosene, light the fuse. Every dimwit editor who sees himself as the source of all dreary blank mange, plain porridge, unleavened literature, licks his guillotine and eyes the neck of any author who dares to speak above a whisper to write above a nursery rhyme. Fire Captain Beatty, in my novel Fahrenheit 451, described how the books were burned first by minorities, each ripping a page or a paragraph from this book, then that, until the day came when the books were empty and the mines shut and the libraries closed forever. Shut the door, they're coming through the window. Shut the window, they're coming through the door, are the words to an old song. They fit my lifestyle with newly arriving butcher slash censors every month. Only six weeks ago I discovered that, over the years, some cubbyhole editors at Ballantine Books, fearful of contaminating the young, had bit by bit censored some 75 separate sections from the novel. Students reading a novel which, after all, deals with censorship and book burning in the future, wrote to tell me of this exquisite irony. Judy Lynn Del Rey, one of the new Ballantine editors, is having the entire book reset and republished this summer with all the dams and hells back in place. A final test for old Job 2 here. 
I sent a play, Leviathan 99, off to a university theater a month ago. My play is based on the Moby Dick mythology, dedicated to Melville, and concerns a rocket crew and a blind space captain who venture forth to encounter a great white comet and destroy the destroyer. My drama premieres as an opera in Paris this autumn. But for now, the university wrote back that they hardly dared do my play. It had no women in it. And the ERA ladies on campus would descend with ball bats if the drama department even tried. Grinding my bicuspids into powder, I suggested that would mean, from now on, no more productions of Boys in the Band, no women. Or the women, no men. Or counting heads, male and female, a good lot of Shakespeare that would never be seen again, especially if you count lines and find that all the good stuff went to the males. I wrote back, maybe they should do my play one week, and the women the next. They probably thought I was joking, and I'm not sure that I wasn't. For it is a mad world, and it will own, and it will get madder if we allow the minorities, be they dwarf or giant, orangutan or dolphin, nuclear head or water conservationalist, pro-computerologist or neo-Luddite, simpleton or sage, to interfere with aesthetics. The real world is the playing ground for each and every group to make or unmake laws. Let me read that again. The real world is the playing ground for each and every group to make or unmake laws. One more time for the people. The real world is the playing ground for each and every group to make or unmake laws. But the tip of the nose of my book or stories or poems is where their rights end and my territorial imperatives begin, run, and rule. Begin, run, and rule. If Mormons do not like my plays, let them write their own. If the Irish hate my Dublin stories, let them rent typewriters. If teachers and grammar school editors find my jawbreaker sentences shatter their mush milk teeth... Sorry. that's That felt like a much more impressive burp as it was building, and then it just kind of puttered out there. Uh, if my teachers and grammar school editors find my jawbreaker sentences shatter their mush milk teeth, let them eat stale cake dunked in weak tea of their own ungodly manufacture. If the Ch- Chicano intellectuals wish to recut my wonderful ice cream suit so it shapes zoot, may the belt unravel and the pants fall. For let's face it, digression is the soul of wit. Take philosophic asides away from Dante, Milton, or Hamlet's father's ghost, and what stays is dry bones. Lawrence Stern said it once, Digressions, incontestably, are the sunshine, the life, the soul of reading. Take them out, and one cold eternal winter would rain in every page. Restore them to the writer. He steps forth like a bridegroom. Bids them all hail, brings in variety, and forbids the appetite to fail. In sum, do not insult me with the beheadings, finger choppings, or the lung deflations you plan for my works. I need my head to shake or nod, my hand to wave or make into a fist, my lungs to shout or whisper with. I will not go gently onto the shelf, degutted to become a non-book. All you umpires, back to the bleachers. Referees hit the showers. It's my game. I pitch. I hit. I catch. What a coincidence. Count Dracula catches too. (laughs) I run the bases. At sunset, I've won or lost. At sunrise, I'm out again, giving it the old try. And no one can help me. Not even you. About the author. Ray Bradbury has purchased some 500 short stories, novels, plays, and poems since his first story appeared in Weird Tales when he was 20 years old. For several years, he wrote for Alfred Hitchcock Presents and The Twilight Zone, and in 1953 did the screenplay for John Huston's Moby Dick. He has produced two of his own plays, written two musicals, two space-age cantatas. Cantatas? What's a cantata? I don't know what that is. Make yourself a dang quesadilla. Cantata. What's a cantata? An attempt to seduce someone by flattery? I don't... I don't think... (coughs) That burp burned my nose. I'm sorry. I'm just going to give up on finding out what a cantata is. Um, Let's move on. Um, cantatas. 
with Lalo Schif- Schifrin and Jerry Goldsmith and collaborated on an animated film, Icarus Mongolfer Wright, which was nominated for an Academy Award in 1962. Mr. Bradbury was idea consultant for the United States Pavilion at the New York World's Fair in 1963, has helped design a ride for Disney World, and is doing consultant work on city engineering and rapid transit. When one of the Apollo astronaut teams landed on the moon, they named Dandelion Dandelion Crater there to honor Bradbury's novel, Dandelion Wine. His novel, Something Wicked This Way Comes, was made into a major release feature film, and his own cable television show called The Ray Bradbury Theater received 19 Cable Award nominations and won seven. And there we go. That does it. We've taken this book from stem to stern. We've taken a classic Count Dracula and myself and we've butchered it. But I'll tell you what. We didn't censor it. We gave it to you the way it was meant to be got. Well, with a little extra thrown in here or there. Um, Count. Yes, Dave? Did you learn absolutely anything during our little literary excursion? I don't think so. You're stern, but you're fair. I've always said that about you, Count. Um, This, you know what, let me tell you. I know I've said this before on my show, but I should I should probably clarify. Because I'm, I'm doing, I'm thinking of this as like a one-off thing. I'm trying to keep in mind this whole Fahrenheit 451 project of ours here. I'm trying to do it as if nobody's ever listened to our show before and that's not hard to do (laughs) it's very easy to have never have listened to my podcast but um so there's this uh this this lovely theater i love it i've been there a bunch of times it's called the indian uh indiana repertory theater and uh they do totally they do great stuff there i love it there and they mail me little pamphlets Whenever they're doing a new, like a new performance or whatnot, uh, uh, for for their their season, they'll do a couple of couple of uh, plays every season. And I remember when I, I I think I looked on their website. No, I didn't get a pamphlet because I would have certainly kept it. I would still have it. I don't think they got that far. But they put up like their plays for the year. They do like a couple, uh, three or four plays per season or whatnot. And uh, last. Spring around around springtime, they sent the or or maybe it was a fall I forget, but they sent out their plays for that particular season, and one of them was Fahrenheit 451, and I lost my fucking shit. I was so happy and excited that they were gonna do uh, a play version of my favorite book of all time at this theater that I go to that I love so very much. Um, I've seen, uh, well, I guess I shouldn't say I've seen a bunch of stuff there, but I've seen, I want to say five. Let's see. Let's go down the list. Why not? We're drinking. I saw um, Dial M for Murder there. I saw Boeing, Boeing, which is really cute. I saw Noises Off. I saw Holmes and Watson, which is good. Really good. Not Holmes and Watson, not that horrible movie they did, but like another thing that that's unrelated. And uh, there was another one. You can't take it with you. I saw uh, as well there. So five. So at least five times. I might be missing one or two. Um, uh, and I was so excited. I was so fucking excited to go see Fahrenheit 451. But then the world exploded. And we had a little, oh, I don't know, worldwide plague. That, that, that kind of knocked the wind out of our sails for about a year or two. And um, so, of course, they had to cancel it. And I don't know if they'll do it again. But God, I would have loved to see that. Like, just, there's not many things I have on my list to do before I die. I'm pretty much done. I'd like that a lot before I get on out of here. 
if I could watch Fahrenheit 451, uh, uh, if I could watch him do that, I'd be really, really happy. So I was, I was crushed. I was crushed at that. And then we're going to do Frankenstein too in October. It's going to be Frankenstein in October. And then I think Fahrenheit 451 in the spring or summer. <clears throat> and both of which got canceled. So fuck life. Fuck everything. Now I'm sad. But it's a good thing that Clarice died. It was a good decision. That's how it should be. That's the right call. That's the right deal. And it's funny. So all that stuff I wrote, I read to you just now about the censorship, about the the the, the little minority groups having issues because there's no men or this is portrayed in a certain way or that's portrayed in this way. And maybe you should change this. Maybe you should change that. It... It kind of makes me feel better about how things are currently and where we're going, society-wise. Because those afterwards and shit, so he said, what, 30-something years after he wrote the book? So it was around the 80s, mid-80s or 80s to 90s or whatever. Somewhere in the 80s when he wrote that. So I guess it's kind of nice to see, well... I guess there have always been shitheads around there, always uh, 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 continually, eternally offended at this, that, or the other thing. So it's kind of nice, I guess, that that's not really a, a, a new thing. Maybe the 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 reach of such groups, such people, is a little bit alarming, or a lot alarming, depending on how you want to look at it. But uh, But I guess it's always been there. And that's somewhat hopeful for me anyway. I got to shave my head. I probably shouldn't be drinking and do this. I'm going to end up a couple of years lighter than normal by the time I'm done. But uh, but yeah, so there we go. Count Dracula has learned absolutely nothing from any of this. I've learned a great deal. I've learned that I too can read at a seventh grade level. That's good. That's good. Better than I thought. Better than my estimates. I I, uh, I called my mother and she was surprised. She was surprised indeed that I can do it. But now count. Now it's time for the, the, the main event, I guess. Because just a few hours ago, um, I sat down. The two of us sat down. And we watched um, the Fahrenheit 451 most recent HBO movie. Now I've already I already saw this when it came out about two years ago, and boy, it was not good the first time. I saw it. Um, I thought it was it was it was bad. It was not good. It was not good. Um, but I figured, hey, since we're doing this, I may as well throw it in there. And review it uh, uh, here in this little little bonus features uh, uh, part of our of our little project that we've done. So I've said it before, and I've said it again. I don't think Michael B. Jordan's a particularly good actor. I think if anything, he's gotten worse as he's gotten older. Like when he was on The Wire, I thought he was good. And now that he's older, he's, I think he's regressing. I think he's getting a, he's becoming a worse actor the older he gets. I, 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 I just don't buy him. I don't know. I think, uh, he's good as a second, like a villain, right? Like in Black Panther as a villain, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, um, but to carry a movie as the lead, I just don't think he's got the chops. For it, um, so I don't think act. I don't think he's a he's a particularly good actor. Some every now and again, if comically bad. I would go so far as to say. But let's talk about it. Let's discuss it. So I, I should have looked this up before, because uh... all right. I 
swear. Sophia Botella? Is that her name? Bo? I don't know. I'm sorry. Forgive me. But I have seen her somewhere else. And I don't know where. She looked so familiar. You know what she reminds me of? She looks like she played Clarice in the movie. And the movie, watching it the second time, it was... <sighs> When I see a movie, a lot of times it takes me a while to formulate an opinion. With Fahrenheit 451, this most recent, I think it was 2018 when it was when it came out. This 20, 2018 version of Fahrenheit 451, it, uh, right off the bat, I was like, I don't like this. It was immediately unlikable to me. And... I think that a great part of Fahrenheit 451, the book, is the way it presents itself. Because it's a dystopian novel, but it's not a dystopian novel, if that makes any sense at all. What I mean by that is, when I think of... Okay, here. Well, you know what? We'll, we'll do this properly. Dystopian. Adjective. Relating to or denoting an imagined state of society where there is great suffering or injustice, right? And if you look at the images for dystopian, it's all bad, it's all shitty, it's all just, you know, uh, uh, it's all bad news. Here's the thing. When you read Fahrenheit 451, it doesn't visually come off that way, Right? The houses are all fireproof. There's this slick sci-fi sheen to it. And uh, like Montag's got a nice house. Uh, 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 he's got a wife. He's got, he's got like the, the, the American dream, I guess you would say, right? I, I'm not picking up like dirty, dingy fucking vibes from Fahrenheit 451. Maybe it's just me. Maybe that's how it's meant to be presented. I wasn't picking that up. It seemed like a very sterilized, very, very clean, consumeristic future to me, right? In the film, right off the bat, it's got these this like zany kind of like Blade Runner, Cyberpunk 20, whatever. I, just like the. <laughs> You don't have to... You see, here's the thing about this book. You don't have to work terribly hard to see the parallels between the time and today. So when they when they try to make... They, when they try to update it and have a variant of... Alexa. Sorry, I... It picked that up. No problem. It picked that up. Can you believe that? It picked that up. Anyway... It's like, yeah, shithead. We don't need to update. If you just play it straight and do a straight version of the book from the, the source material presented, right? People are not dumb apes. Well, at least I like to think so. They'll get the parallels. You don't need to spell it out for us, guys. You don't need to, to, to do the whole like social media type. You just don't update it. It doesn't need to be updated. You don't need to update something that's ahead of its time. Do you see where I'm going with this? Right? And if they would have just made it this neat, super crisp, super clean kind of future instead of this like stupid, weird, like Clarice is part of this like dirty underground <laughs> you you're not don't make this sexy do you, please you know i i know that's all you know is making things edgy and gritty and all oh, virtual reality i understand that i know that's where you're born that's that, that's all you know 
right is how to take something and make it make it make it so modern and so bleeding edge uh computer cool and whatnot it's unnecessary you don't need to do that for this the story does it for itself and it just seems like they're pandering you know by 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 kind of playing those cards and it just was dumb the fahrenheit 451 movie was dumb (laughs) it was dumb and it was silly um i mean let me try to let me let me say some good things about it i guess um i love michael shannon i love him i love this man i just think he's great i think he i think casting wise yes he makes a good captain Beatty. i like that i'm i'm for that i i agree i would uh I, i i like that a lot i thought his acting was all right um, for what they gave him, I guess. I loved Boardwalk Empire. I loved him in Boardwalk Empire. Um, I never saw Man of Steel. Maybe I should since he's in it. If, if I do watch Man of Steel, it'll be solely because of Michael Shannon. Um, because I love this man. I, I, I do. And... With the movie, they tried to make it, it, they turned it from just books into all media. So the firemen would go and they'd round up like hard drives filled with movies and burn film. And it's like, you're, you're casting a wide net and doing, when you, when you add in technology, computers, the internet, or the the nine as they call it in this movie, and and when you do all that, it becomes more and more outlandish to the point where the firemen are like this quasi secret police type deal, and you tried to cover so much ground that I feel it just was bland, unbelievable. And dumb. And I mean, I know we're talking about science fiction and robot dogs and shit, but even that being the case, this premise was just sort of silly to me. And uh, I, uh, uh, no robot dog, no no robot hound. I'm not particularly particularly mad about that, by the way, because I understand, you know, that could be difficult to do in uh, in movies with special effects or whatnot. And I don't know how much money they had to do this. Um, but it's it, they actually set this film in Cleveland, which I thought was interesting because in the book they don't really say where it's set. I mean, it's in America somewhere. I'm assuming maybe. I mean, he he says he met Mildred in Chicago, so maybe it's supposed to be in. I mean, they could have met and moved somewhere else. I don't know. But uh, they don't really say where this is set. Uh, so I thought that was kind of interesting that they just name dropped Cleveland and said it in Cleveland. Uh, it just, it, it seems silly, man, just silly. Um, the whole social media tie in again, don't, you don't need to spell this out guys. It does its job perfectly. It doesn't need your fucking help. It doesn't need you to handhold the audience and say, hey, dummies, hey, you stupid retards, check this out. This is, isn't this like a good parallel to our society now? Like, just play it straight. People will get it, right? And if they don't get it, fine. Leave the ape people in the mud. Leave the dummies doing dumb things. If they don't, if they can't find this easy analogy, then, then, (laughs) <laughs> then God help them, right? And their stupid brains. So I thought that was lame. Um, I, I, if I could say something else positive, I liked the, like the wardrobe. I, I liked how the firemen looked. I thought the outfits were kind of cool. I guess. That's a good thing, right? I liked the actress who played Clarice. I thought she was pretty. Um, in a, in a weird way, in like a, in a, in a, there's, see, there's different categories of girls for me. And I would consider the, the actress who played Clarice, I would consider her striking. I wouldn't be like, oh, she's fucking hot. God, that girl's hot. She's kind of, she's kind of got like a, 
a masculine chin. Like, I'm kind of jealous. I want her facial structure. Like, she's got, like, a proud kind of jaw and, like, a. she looks... I don't want to say she looks manly because she doesn't. She's pretty. Well, uh, maybe pretty is not... Striking. Striking is a really good word. Like, you see her and you're like, oh, wow, look at that. Look at that. Uh, um, and, uh, yeah, so I guess uh, she is attractive. I liked the way she looked. Um, but, again... She's part of this, like, underground resistance, blah, blah, blah. And it... (sighs) Ugh. Ugh. Um, She doesn't die. Beatty doesn't die. Montag dies at the end. I don't know. I guess that's supposed to, like, be some kind of weird shocker. Uh, Okay. Um... When the, the, the lady in the house sets herself on fire... She, like, dramatically tears open her clothes and there's, like, books taped to her when she's... It was so corny and so, so laughable. Like, just a laughable fucking part that's supposed to be high drama. And it comes off so silly and so dumb. Uh, I really didn't like that. There's no Mildred, which is just... Okay, right off the bat, that's an enormous mistake. The relationship between uh, Mildred and her husband, that is... To me, the fucking, the, that is such a vital part of this fucking book and this story. And that right there explains so much about society and people and, 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 and what they've turned into. And for them not to include that in the book, in the movie is just, it just goes to show how absolute and complete the utter missing of the point was for whoever is involved in this that they could read the book know the story and say eh, we don't need her in the in this movie she's not important we don't need her like you just don't fucking get it you just don't get it uh and it it, it shows it shows a lot so there's no mildred there's no professor faber um it's just, it's just, I, and again, the little pushes, the little, right? Clarice, so in the, in the, in the film, Clarice doesn't die. She lives. If any, you know, she bones Montag and they end up fucking, uh, Clarice lives. There's no Mildred. Uh, there's no hound. There's no Faber. It's like, so all the little things that kind of nudged and pushed the character in the book to eventually go where he ended up going are either gone or changed. And it's just seeing this silly, goofy scene where this girl is burnt up makes Montag start looking into what these people are, are trying to, to preserve here. It, it was just, ugh. And there's this, like, side story where Montag, like, his father was a fireman, but he had books so they burned his shit and they like erased his identity or whatnot. And Beatty was one of the guys who was there and did it. And then I, it's like they had this side story that they never really finished. I mean, they put like the, sh- the, 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 I mean, I, again, I'm not a very perceptive person. So I'm willing to take the loss on this and say this was just me. Correct me if I'm wrong, if you've seen it. But th- does this seem incomplete? Like, they just never really fully went on with, okay, like, what's the deal? Why did... (sighs) It was bad. It was really bad. Um, I I thought when I was watching it, again, when, when I started it up, I was like, you know what? Maybe I didn't give this like a too, too good of a chance. Let me watch this again. Let me really, let me really try to try to get with this. And, uh, uh, no, I was right. It sucks. It's not good. It's not very good at all. Um, it's really, really not misses the point entirely. Just completely misses the point. Um, from the book. And, uh, let me think, trying to think of anything else here. trying to do a positive let's do a positive something good um okay all right so when they do these burnings or whatnot 
and the firemen show up. It's kind of like a show, like a live broadcast type deal. And you have, what I did like was they had like these um, emojis or whatever that would pop up on the screen. So you have like a bunch of people watching somebody's house get burnt up live or whatnot. And then they'll, they just, uh, you just see a bunch of hearts or whatever. Or if something bad happened, you'd see like a bunch of frowny faces or thumbs down. Like a, I thought, I mean, I don't like, I don't like the obvious in your face connecting the dots for you. Like, hey, see the parallels between our society. I think that's lame and dumb. Um, but I did think it was, if you're going to do that, at least that's kind of a neat way to do it. Like I liked the instant kind of gratification, instant feedback um, that was on the on kind of on the screens. And they played all this shit like on on huge building sides, and like it just. I really didn't like it. <laughs> I really didn't like it, even from the very beginning. Just the kind of tone that this film tries to set. And you have like Beatty and Montag and, and, and they're like boxing. They're having this like, <laughs> Oh my God. It's, it's the, it's the ultimate, like this ain't your daddy's Fahrenheit 451. This is fucking dumb. Like they may as well have been blasting like Nickelback or, or or let the bodies hit the floor in the background to to kind of like, hey guys, look, this is cool. Like we're updating a an old fuddy duddy classic book. Like we're making it sexy and hot. And Clarice is like this fucking underground cyberpunk girl and deleting fingerprints and oh my god look at all this cool computers virtual reality man oh my god this, this is like ray bradbury can only dream of how cool we're gonna make this shit it's it's so bad it's so over the top in your fucking face 360 degree slam dunk bad uh, uh just the choices that were made uh for this and so they have okay all right one thing i i did like a lot they the book people or whatever they have this kid this like autistic guy who can like remember a t- i liked him i thought he was really cool and i liked the way they pulled that off and i think that could have worked and i don't know i just thought that was a neat part in the book he was a neat character because I was like, oh, it's just some fucking retarded guy. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> who, you know, he's a rain man, pretty much, and he could just memorize a lot. That I liked. I liked that. That was cool. They could have, I think they could have done a little bit more than that. And then they had this fucking, this weird thing. I don't understand. This thing called Omnis, where it's like these, these, this underground movement somehow put all of the books and all of the media in the universe. <laughs> In this one little DNA strand that was going to be, like, released somehow. They're going to put it on a thing, on a bird, and then fly it into space or whatever. The f- It was so rapidly, quickly glossed over. Like, oh, yeah, and oh, yeah, r- r- real quick before everybody leaves, uh... They've somehow managed to put all of the knowledge on this planet and history in this little DNA thing. And if they if it escapes, then everybody will be gods, or they'll know everything. Or I don't I don't know. Everything we're trying to suppress will get out, and that will somehow make things bad. I don't know. I don't know how this works. I don't know what the DNA thing like. Okay, and like hey, Dave, we we found a DNA a DNA sample from you that has your baldness and fatness in it. Like, okay, so we're going to release it into the world. What does that mean? You're going to release it? How? You're you're just going to take a DNA thing, crush it in your fist, and blow it into the air, and somehow that's going to do something? Like, what is happening? You have to do a better job of explaining this. No, 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 future gobbledygook. It's just future future gunk. You get it. Uh, no, that's not good enough. Like, you're going to have to do a little better than that, I I feel. It was bad. (laughs) 
It was terrible. It was horrible. It was so stupid. And uh, at the end, like, Montag goes and he joins up with the the rebel people. They're called eels for some reason. And then um, he releases a pigeon with the DNA of knowledge in it for some... I don't, I don't know. And the pigeon flies off. And... Q swelling inspirational music and that's it. And Montag dies. He gets blown up by Captain Beatty. Uh, I mean, whatever, man. Whatever. It sucked. It sucked. Maybe, maybe even worse than the first time I saw it. I don't know. Just wow, man. Wow, you missed the point entirely, didn't you? didn't you trying to make it all sleek and fucking sexy and (laughs) oh boy but you know good points uh michael shannon is always a good point for me he he rules i don't know sorry i i love the i love the man i think he's great he's got so much positive credit with me for boardwalk empire just that he can make a lot of bad decisions and still be okay with me. Um, and this was certainly a bad one. This was a a bad decision. I'm trying to think. I, I'm trying to. I, I can't tell you what a mistake it was to not have just to have Montag be some single dude like it. That you are missing the point here, uh, big time. Totally big time. You 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 missed the point. Oh, also, oh, I'm glad I for, I didn't forget this. There are a couple more things that are dumb. So he's trying to get in good with these book people, Clarice's little band of whatever the fuck rebels. And they said, "Do you really want to join us?" And he was like, "Yes, I do." And then they said, "Okay, well, there's a fireman up in the attic. You have to kill him to prove your loyalty." Now look. I like the fact that they just don't take his word for it. It's not just like, I want to join you. I was a fireman. Okay, well, fine. Well, I guess you're in, right? I like that there's precaution and he has to kind of prove himself. But the way they did it was so fucking dumb. Like, there's a fireman in the attic. Go kill him. It's like, what? They they didn't at all push him to the point where that would even be a feasible character decision, right? Yet he takes a knife and he goes upstairs and he sees somebody tied to a chair and he's like storming up like he's going to prison shank this person and then they stop him. It's like, uh, uh, um, you know, that Bible story where, uh, where sick, sick fuck God is like, hey, go kill your kid real quick. And the guy's like, all right, why not? Sure, I don't like him. I don't like him either. And then right when he's going to do it, God's like, wait, don't kill your kid. And the guy's like, ah, fuck. It was bad and dumb. So I thought that was just so laughably stupid. So laughably stupid. Um, uh, and and um, the... I don't know what's going on. The leader of the rebels, so to speak. I don't know what's with her acting. It was some of the worst acting I've ever seen in my life. It it was literally like like that day they found this woman uh, uh, in Starbucks or something. And we're like, would you like to be in a film? Oh, but I don't know. I don't know the lines or whatever. It's like, don't worry. I'm going to write them on a card and I'm going to hold them off screen. And you just read them as you go. She, she was complete. It was almost like they just woke her up and were like, go out there and just read the, I don't know what's going on. What is this about? I don't like, she seemed completely disinterested in the story and what she was doing and just about everything. Uh, that she was terrible. She was a horrible actress. And I've seen her before in something. I don't... Okay, hold on. Let me get to the bottom of this here.
Wait a minute. Why does it say? It says that they, were, they had a Mildred Mon, but she's not. Oh, deleted scenes. Okay, so they did have Mildred, but she was deleted. They did cast somebody and they had scenes with her in it. And they deleted the scenes. Wow. These people don't know what they're fucking doing, do they? Okay, anyway. Anyway, where where is this woman? I, I have to find her. I don't know where she is. Is this it? Candy Alexander. Candy Al yes, that's her. Candy Alexander. She was she was sissy from CB4. Oh my god. <laughs> By the way, CB4 criminally underrated. CB4 is fucking fantastic. CB4 rules. I know I've seen her in other things though. Yeah, she can act. What's she fucking doing? She she was horrible in this. She was terrible in this. Oh, God. Oh, sissy, what have they done to you? Anyway, uh, Fahrenheit 451, it it sucked. Um, not good. Even worse than I remember. Um, yeah. That's about it. Oh, yeah, Sophia Bo Bo Botella. Um, she looks like, uh, what's her name? What's the girl? The little girl from All in the Family. Ugh. I can't think. I can't think. She ended up joining that band, the New Radicals. Sophia? Was her name Sophia? I don't remember. But but yeah, she she looks like the little girl Sophia from All in the Family. I thought it was her for a second, but that's impossible. <laughs> that's impossible because time and because years. Um yeah. Count, you know what? Fuck, Dave. I I just I just I just realized something. This whole time, this whole experience, the Fahrenheit 451 experience that we've with the journey that we've 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 come on. I never gave you the chance to read. Not even a little bit, not even once. So right now what I'd like here, right now, we're going to start this all... We're going to do this all again right now. I would like you... Please. We, you've seen... You've heard my take on it. Now I want you to do yours. Here's the book. I'm going to sit quietly, patiently, and listen. I want you to give us your... Ancient, old, wizened, undead take on this literary classic. Here you go, buddy. Oh, wow. It's my big moment. My time to shine. Here, let me just see the book real quick. Oh, I, oh, oh it's a slippery one, this one. Oh, boy. Oh, my God. Here we fucking go. I just spilled beer all over the place. Um, Look, man. Count, can you can you hurry up here? I, I kind of got shit to do. Oh, Dave, but it's slippery. You know, my, my rheumatism acts up from time to time. Oh, God, what the fucking rheumatism. Are you going to read or not? Are we just... Look, Dave, uh, why don't we clean up the mess we just made? And uh, we'll try this some other time, okay? Uh, I got to go, everybody. Bye-bye. Uh,